Hello, everybody. It's me, Fee, or Fiona Timms, otherwise known as White Zulu, author of my autobiography of the same name. And I welcome you all to another chapter of my book. I do hope you're all enjoying my life story. And I must thank all of you for being such dedicated subscribers, especially those who have written such complimentary comments below my videos. They are much appreciated. I would like to point out that the previous South African flag hanging on the wall behind me is not a political statement. It is simply a piece of history in the background of my first 50 years of my life, being born and growing up in my beloved mother country, South Africa. My autobiography, White Zulu, is not a political commentary and frankly describes my experiences of growing up with the Zulu tribe as my family. That flag is simply a piece of cloth signifying the history of South Africa. It was originally used by the Union of South Africa from 1928 to 1961 and later the Republic of South Africa until 1994. This is Feria Mackay James. She said, do you remember? I told you about him a while ago. He held out a warm hand and looked directly into my eyes. He had lovely little crinkles at the outer corners of his gentle hazel eyes, giving me the impression that he was amused. How do you do, he said politely, in his deliciously plummy public school accent, and his eyes twinkled at me. Please call me Fred. I prefer it to Feria. It sounds so pretentious, don't you think? And then he blushed again and looked down at his shoes. My heart gave a little skip and a delicious thrill ran through my entire body. Oh, my God, I thought to myself, he's gorgeous. How could I have been so stupid as to throw out that piece of paper with his name on it? Look what I've been missing. Then I wondered, slightly panicky now, whether I was too late and somebody else had snapped him up in the meantime. I needed to find out as soon and as surreptitiously as possible whether he had a girlfriend already. He was so divine. I knew he must have swept some lucky girl off her feet as soon as he'd arrived from Scotland. Are you enjoying being here in Durban? I asked. I love it, he replied, but I've been so busy these past few months, I haven't had a chance to look around properly. This sounded more encouraging to me. Perhaps he hadn't had time to find anybody yet. Where are you working, I asked, remembering that I'd been told he was a civil engineer. I'm with Christiania Niels Nielsen, the Danish civil engineering company, and we're rebuilding Pier Number 2 at the Sugar Terminal. It's out of town and we're behind schedule, so I'm working long hours at the moment and just have time to get back to my flat make some supper, and then I have to go to bed, bed pretty early as we have to start at seven in the morning to get the job finished by our deadline. He chuckled ruefully and looked down at his shoes, shaking his head. I gave an inward sigh of relief. It didn't sound as though he'd had time to be snapped up after all. While we chatted, I took the opportunity to inspect him even more closely. His hair was more chestnut than brown and had gold lights in it. He had a glorious, flawless English complexion. Not pasty white like some poms I'd met, but fairly tanned 
And when he blushed, as he frequently did, and the warm colour rose into his smooth cheekbones, I felt my knees go weak. I caught a glimpse of the sparkle of a fraction of golden stubble on his chin, where he'd missed a tiny spot while shaving. I wanted to put my nose to his neck just beneath his ear and breathe in, inhaling the scent of him. My heart was fluttering now and my hand, holding my glass of wine, was trembling ever so slightly. I'd never felt like this before in my life. I was worried too. I didn't want to seem forward, but I wanted so badly to offer him a sightseeing tour of Durban and its beautiful coast and hoped I hadn't left it too late. It might seem too much like asking him out on a date, and he looked the sort of man who could be put off by a brash, brass-cheeky sort of girl. I had to act as ladylike as possible, but still get what I wanted. Have you seen much of Durban? I asked cautiously. The coast, I mean, rather than the city and the docks. He shook his head. I'd like to, though, but I don't really know the best places to go. I held my breath, willing him to go on. I wonder if you could show me where the best beaches are, or rather, where it would be nicest for a swim, he asked shyly and blushed, smiling so that tiny curved dimples bracketed his mouth. That's if you'd like to, of course, he said quickly anxiously. You must be very busy and have better things to do. I've got a car, though, so I could drive us around. Better things to do, I gasped inwardly. There was nothing in the world I wanted to do more than spend all my time with him, preferably the rest of my life. I'd love to, I said enthusiastically, smiling up at his face. Looking into his eyes, I noticed tiny gold flecks in the hazel. I was absolutely smitten, mesmerized by something in him that had the effect of a powerful magnet dragging me towards him. My surroundings had faded into background buzz, and all I could do was focus on this man his deep, thoughtful eyes, his mouth, which I so badly wanted to kiss, and his tall, lean body that I wanted to press myself against to feel his arms reassuringly circling me. This, I knew, was lust. But there was something else. There was something more. He made me feel all warm, warm, and gooey inside, and strangely vulnerable with longing, slightly scared, too. I'd often felt attracted to men, but not with this intensity, this overwhelming need to be with him. I'd never had this fear that a man might walk, to, might walk away at any moment and leave me bereft. Was this a cliché? Love at first sight? I'll pick you up tomorrow then, he said, after I'd explained to him where Nora House was. At about eleven. Elated, I spent the rest of the day at the races in a delicious haze of joy and anticipation. I tried not to follow Fred around, like a puppy, but I couldn't help myself and I made sure I was there when he needed his drink refilled or a plate of food offered. He had this lovely English humour. He'd say something self-deprecating about his rotten luck and ineptitude at gambling on the horses, but in a dry, wry way with his eyes twinkling and his shy smile, 
which emphasized the little crinkles at the corners of his lovely mouth. He was so funny that he had everybody chuckling as he recounted a story every now and again, throwing their heads back with delighted laughter. And afterwards he'd look down at the ground and blush in his wonderfully shy way. I couldn't take my eyes off him. I couldn't wait for tomorrow either. The next morning I got up early and spent a long time getting dressed and ready. Some makeup, but not too much. Shorts or capri pants. I wanted to show off my long, slim, tanned legs, but I didn't want to look cheap. I washed my hair the night before and brushed it now until it shone in its glossy way. I spritzed myself with Madame Rocha's perfume from a large and very expensive bottle, which my previous boyfriend Gary had, brought, had bought for me in Paris. Picked up my straw beach bag, which contained my bikini, towel and coppertone santan oil, and ran downstairs. Fred arrived in his white Ford Escort and immediately jumped out of his car to walk around quickly and open the passenger door for me. I slid into the seat. He looked every bit as good as he had yesterday, even better perhaps now that he wore a loose white cotton shirt and khaki shorts revealing his long tanned legs. Let's go up the north coast to Salt Rock, I said. Have you brought your swimming costume? Yep, he replied. It's in the boot. And we set off. It was early July, a typically glorious winter's day with a bright blue sky. The air temperature was comfortably hot, but not, but no longer as humid as it is throughout the summer. The sea was that colour of blue that is usually re reserved for toothpaste commercials and the beaches looked pristine and golden against the white foam of the waves. I showed him where to take the Zululand Coastal Road, which runs alongside the sea between the beach and the dense dark green natural bush that grows all the way up the coast. Inland, the gentle rolling countryside was planted with sugar cane and a soft breeze blew the tall waving green cane in ripples so that it looked like an emerald sea in contrast to the deep blue Indian Ocean that lay to our right. Salt Rock is a small holiday resort consisting mainly of a motley collection of beach cottages built along the shore, some of which were owned by friends and cousins of ours and where we'd spent so many wonderful summer holidays as children. There was a small general store, a filling station, a delightful little golf course in among the sand dunes, and best of all, right on the beach, a small, modestly old-fashioned hotel which must have been built in the 1930s. The front of the building consisted mainly of a great expanse of open veranda, which overlooked a big sea pool that had been built among some massive boulders that jut out from the surrounding beach and into which the waves break at high tide. It was low tide now, and the crystal clear spook, uh, pool sparkled invitingly at us. We changed into our costumes and walked down the steps. Fred dipped his toe into the water. It's warm, he said in surprise. The seas warm all, all year round, even at midwinter, I replied. And we slipped into the pool. The bottom had 
the bottom of it was covered in sand and the walls had been colonized by sea life over the years so that when we swam underwater it seemed as though we were looking at an ocean reef tiny bright orange blue and white fish some with silver stripes and others with yellow and black spots swam around among the barnacles and darted in and out among delicate and, pur and purple sea anemones. We should have brought goggles, I said, as I brushed salt water from my eyes. Next time, perhaps, and my heart leaped with joy. He was talking about a future visit here. After an hour or so swimming and sunning ourselves on the boulders that surrounded the pool, Fred said, should we have some lunch? I'm starving. Still in our bathing costumes, we walked up to the hotel and sat on the veranda overlooking the sea and drank ice-cold castle lager out of tall glasses. The waiter brought us platters of crayfish, which had been caught off the very rocks we'd been lying on and cooked to succulent perfection, served with rich creamy mayonnaise and a crisp green salad. We dug flesh from the scarlet shells with our fingers. Firm, chilled white meat, each morsel frilled with a fragment or two of lace-like red skin, releasing juicy mouthfuls of sea-flavoured bliss at each bite. Somebody told me it was Helen Africa, but I have to disagree, sighed Fred happily and raised his glass to me. This is the life. Cheers. I spent the rest of the day in a daze of pleasure and anticipation, which escalated to excitement as we drove back to Durban, skins tingling slightly from exposure to sea sun and expectancy. Normally, my dates barely waited to turn the ignition off before their hands pulled me towards them for the first kiss. Invariably, I'd had to come up for air, eventually fending them off with one arm, my other hand on the car door handle. The lady warden doesn't allow snogging in car parked cars, Outside Nora House, I'd have to explain. I'll be gated if she catches us. And then I'd pull myself away, secure in the knowledge that there'd be another date set. Well, then just let's drive around the corner out of sight then, would be the inevitable reply. I was happily mentally going through this little charade in my head right up to the point of showing Fred which corner to drive around. The one under a twisted flamboyant tree whose flat umbrella-like top conven conveniently profuse at this time of the year with riotously bright red lily-shaped flowers grew at the perfect angle to hide a parked car from the front office window out of our residence so we could get down to some pleasant hanky-panky. To my intense disappointment, once Fred had turned the engine off and after I'd sat there expectantly poised on the passenger seat, almost with my lips puckered, he gave me a demure peck on the cheek. Would um would you um like to go out to dinner tomorrow night? He asked tentatively. If you're not busy, he added quickly. I was thrilled. Maybe he did fancy me. I so badly wanted to reach out and touch his face, lick the tiny crystals of sea salt I saw had dried on his temple. I imagined how, mingled with his perspiration, they would taste on my tongue tip. I realized I was sitting in the passenger seat and just staring at him 
with saliva collecting in my mouth. I felt slightly shocked at myself. This was raw, blatant lust. And there I'd been playing, trying to play it so cool and hard to get. It wasn't like me to feel so irresistibly drawn to a man, any man, in this way. Yes, I'd love to, I replied, still slightly taken aback at this unexpected turn of events. I gathered up my beach bag and sand encrusted towel. As I leaned over to reach my things from the back seat, I noted, noticed that his rich auburn hair had twisted into downy, damp tendrils at the back against his neck, and I had to force myself not to reach out my fingers to stroke them. Shall I pick you up at seven then, he asked hesitantly. Yes, of course, that would be lovely, I said, and sat for a heartbeat long longer, wondering if I could risk lingering without losing my head, doing something crazy and ruining my chances forever. My God, I didn't want to scare him off. He seemed so skittish. It was just as well I'd only had two castle lagers with my lunch, or who, who knew what I might have done. My inhibitions were precarious right enough now. With some effort, fortunately inaudible sigh, I put my hand on the door handle, at which signal, signal Fred jumped out and hurried around to open my door for me. I had to get out, however reluctantly, and I waved to him before I walked into the building. That's it for now. More to come. And thank you so much for listening. Thank you, too, to John Moslane for being my sound engineer. And um, we'll hear some more about Fred next week. Goodbye. That is all for the time being, and there's more to come next week. I would like to thank John Moslane for putting aside his Friday afternoons to help me produce these videos. Without him, I could not do this. I would also like to thank Sean van Furen for his sterling work in uploading my videos to my YouTube channel adding the photos, as well as managing my channel so professionally. If you would like to know more about my other works, I have written five books in all, and each one is autobiographical. Please visit my website at www.whitezulubook.com where you will find a lot more information, as well as plenty of photographs. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed my life story, and there is plenty more to come. A thumbnail photo will be attached each week. And thank you so much for all your support and all the very kind remarks you make um, in complimenting me on my work. I really appreciate it. Goodbye. <laughs>